Welcome back to the Cyber Matters Podcast, powered by the Cyber Guild. Today, our host is Jamil Evans, President and CTO of Evans and Chambers Technology and Cyber Guild Board of Advisors member. He is joined by our featured guest, Greg Crabb, Principal Consultant for Side Channel and founder of 108. Greg is the former CISO of the U.S. Postal Service. He is a respected and sought-after advisor by organizations seeking to protect digital assets and develop and apply best practices and pragmatic cybersecurity strategies. Hey, Greg. Thanks for joining us again today here on uh, Cyber Matters. Um, I know we spoke a couple uh, times before, once last week at our in-person uh, networking event uh, called Cybertunity. Um, but uh, so I understand you're from D.C. Is that right? Yeah. Thanks for having me here, Jamila. And yeah, I was born uh, in D.C. And uh, my folks were uh, worked for the FBI. And so... Uh, that was a uh, that was the beginning of my uh, time here in Washington, and then I returned to the D.C. area about 15 years ago to raise my family and my wife and two boys here. Uh, we live in Northern Virginia and uh, just love it here. Nice. So we've got that in common. I'm from D.C. as well, born and raised in D.C. So that's very cool. Um, and that's interesting about your FBI uh, parents are as, as part of your background. Do you think that encouraged you to get into cyber? Oh, I, I think it encouraged me to get into law enforcement. Law enforcement. And, okay. um, a- absolutely. I remember uh, when I was seven years old, my dad took me into the Hoover building. And I remember just talking about all the cases that he had worked and, you know, it kind of some of the old memorabilia of past investigations of Bonnie and Clyde and, you know, all that sort of stuff going, going way back. And, you know, when I was seven, I didn't know who all those people were, but it was just pretty cool to be able to have that experience to, and and to recognize the need um, that law enforcement has. I my uh, my seventeen year old, uh, although I was not an FBI agent, I retired as a United States Postal Inspector. Uh, my seventeen year old aspires to be an FBI agent. His uh, his role model is my business partner uh, Andrew McCabe and. Uh, he's obsessed with anything that has to do with criminology and uh, uh, behavioral science and and all that good stuff. Well, oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Um, so, how did you actually uh, get into law enforcement? Can you tell, talk a little bit more about that? Of course. So, uh, I uh, had the good occasion of coming out of uh, college and actually working for the Department of Energy's Office of Inspector General. And I started as an auditor. And in 1996, uh, kind of following in my father's trajectory of being in law enforcement, uh, I wanted to become a U.S. Postal Inspector. My uh, my grandfather had been a, a postal carrier in a small little town in southern Ohio, and uh, I used to love walking the streets in that little town with with Grandpa, and you know, really understanding the importance of the postal service in connecting that little community. Everybody loved Grandpa because he had served them for you know decades as their letter carrier, and that really resonated with me. And so I really wanted to become a U.S. Postal Inspector and really uh, participate in how secure communications are made in in the uh, in the uh, United States. And 1996, the world was a lot different than it is today. Uh, the Postal Service and the importance of communications in the mail were uh, was much greater. Uh, however. Uh, I think through my career, I understood uh, my need to uh, really uh, ex- uh, understand how the economy is changing, how technology is changing the economy, and being part of that push to to make the postal service uh, a great benefit for uh, the new economy and uh, you know little companies like. Uh, uh, that little thing that Jeff Bezos did out of the the back of his uh, his truck, uh, where he, or his car, where he uh, pull up to the to the back of the post office and drop a couple of books off at the at the post office in order to be able to deliver be delivered and to see how that has grown and um, yeah that that was uh, sort of my origins and 
you know, due to my audit background, I, I started in the postal service, uh, as a, as an IG auditor type, uh, uh, doing financial statement audits. And my responsibility was electronic data processing controls. So for literally three or four years, all I did was make sure that access control to the mainframes and paychecks were properly uh, distributed and payables were being properly controlled from a security perspective. And then I got rolled out in 1999 to a different function. And we talked about this a little bit last night, Jamil. So, uh, you know, I'm kind of rolling with some of the questions that we had talked about, but mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, in 99, I was assigned to work fraudulent workers' compensation investigations. So, so postal employees that were out with various injuries. And I remember uh, I, I enjoyed those cases. However, uh, I remember sitting in the back of my surveillance vehicle one afternoon uh, watching a claimant that had claimed a, a back injury and was on on long-term disability and you know that claimant was pulling all of the household goods out of his uh, home and putting them onto a u-haul truck to move to ohio but that's a different part of the story <laughs> i was really um, uh, uh, fantasizing about cyber and the importance of uh, these technology issues that were really budding and developing and how e-commerce e was becoming such an important topic. And I was out in California, out in San Jose, California. And I remember that afternoon I visualized uh, becoming the chief information security officer of the United States Postal Ooh, Service. Wow. Yeah. And you know, that put me on a trajectory uh, for the next 15 years of my career uh, to really put my arms around what does, you know, what is the adversarial environment that we face as practitioners? Mm -hmm. And I had the good fortune of a bunch of badges and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, handcuffs and a gun in order to be able to literally chase uh cyber criminals to the ends of the world and uh that uh really gave me a great education on um you know how what we face as practitioners today so uh, that i went way too long on your question there i apologize Jimmy. oh that's that's awesome though i mean it's amazing that you were able to visualize and chart a goal for your career to be the CISO of the postal service and, and actually achieve that um it's to me that's a that job is is such a critically responsible job of to protect the organization, right? I mean, uh, it sounds like you you got your hands into a lot of different areas when it comes to security and understanding risk and operations of the postal service. So you you're probably well equipped, uh, over very well equipped to, to take on that role. Did you did you feel, uh, you know, what were some of the challenges that you felt uh, moving into the postal service part of this conversation? Um, as CISO, like what were some of the biggest challenges of running, running, uh, protecting the postal service? Yeah, the, the postal service is an amazing, uh, hub to a, a huge ecosystem of senders and receivers, right? Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, an unbelievable platform to be able to support the nation. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, prior to becoming the CISO, I had been responsible for revenue product and global security for the organization. Mm -hmm. And that really gave me a strong understanding of uh, the revenue generating services of the organization, mm -hmm. the product uh, innovations that the organization was making, mm -hmm. and also the adversarial situation that we faced from a global security perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the in, in 2014, uh, I was leading the investigation into a mass data compromise of the Postal Service. We had been notified from some partners that um, there was some nefarious activity going on that was sourced to a to a nation state actor. And uh, lo and behold, uh, the investigation that I led ultimately resulted in uh, the identification of uh, the loss of all of our 
uh, employee data to uh, to this nation state. And, mm -hmm. you know, it was at the same time as the OPM breach and, um, mm -hmm. you know, the motives of, of the actor have kind of been played out in, in the media um, about their interest in, in understanding, you know, government employee uh, data. But uh, that was the day that I briefed the the postmaster general uh, was sort of the recognition of the postmaster general that we needed to have um, an increased security presence in our information security program. Mm -hmm. And I was, I, I was able to uh, inherit what the program had been, it, uh, you know, just from a context perspective, the postal service is a huge organization. Um, annually, our revenues are a, uh, over 70 billion uh, last year, they were 78 billion, uh, over 600,000 employees, 31,000 retail locations. Uh, literally, the carrier comes to 160 million addresses every day in the United States. Um, and uh, we have hundreds of plants, 300 plants across the United States that have operational technology that, that move the mail. And so you can imagine all of the complexities of a large manufacturing type operation, a large retail organization. Um, you know, that was that was what we walked into, what I walked into. And my information security practice that I inherited was 20 employees, 20 contractors, <laughs> and a $10 million budget. Wow. wow. And you know, that um to say that that was woefully under-resourted is an understatement. Clearly, okay. right? well, you answered the next question I had, but I assumed <laughs> I assumed so. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Uh, and so, over the next uh, three years, I grew the the program into a right-sized uh, cybersecurity practice for the organization, and had the good fortune of leading about 450 professionals dedicated to protecting the mail and packages of every household in America uh, every day, which was just an honor. And I did that for six years and um, really, you know, have uh, all of the battle scars of a CISO and um, also all of the, uh, all the triumphant uh, stories of, you know, the, the challenges that we overcome came to be able to do that successfully. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. Um, you know, I'm, I'm struck because in, in my um, undergrad graduate education, I took a networking course and uh, in a, through the course of my career, of course, networks have been, computer networks have been, uh, you know, critical to everything. Um, but it's really interesting to me that the parallels between computer networking, uh, the internet, TCP, all those kinds of things, and uh, the Postal Service. So the fact that you mentioned uh, as a postal inspector, I mean, each of, each of those letters contains data. Um, that data needs to be protected. That data, and that's how networks work. Data tr travels in packets that, you know, have a, a from and to. Uh, that needs to happen quickly. It needs to happen securely. Um, it's just it's interesting to, to think of the parallels and in, in protecting physical paper or physical paper mail. Um, you know, if, you, if you're able to I'm wondering if, if, if the process of being able to inspect and protect and to get that optimized, um, does that help you? Does that help you uh, when you move into the cyber realm and it starts to get into digital uh, security? Does that help you? Do you see the parallels there? I, I, absolutely. I think um, one of my favorite quotes about the post office is from Seinfeld in the late 90s. And uh, uh, Jerry's mailman, uh, you know, everybody remembers Newman mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, they love to hate Newman, but, uh, one of, one of my favorite lines is Newman would say, it was when you control the mail, you control information. <laughs> and, you know, to your point, Jamil, you know, it, it's, it's about information and, and securely transmitting information. And some of those characteristics around confidentiality, integrity, availability, uh, uh, something that's extremely important to uh, a postal inspector. And, and we uh, live and breathe by this uh, particular um, uh, uh, philosophy is sanctity, 
uh, that sanctity of the mail that when you put a letter in the mailbox, it's not going to be read. It's going to maintain those privacy can, uh, characteristics all the way through the life cycle. And so for me, that is, uh, those are the characteristics that are, I think, really important uh, as uh, you talk as we talk about this from a risk management discussion, mm-hmm. uh, because mm-hmm. those are the fundamental uh, risk parameters that every uh, risk officer should be thinking about relative to the integrity of their information uh, and communications within their organizations. Yeah, and that makes sense from a postal service perspective. That's critical. Um, it's reputation almost. It's it's a uh, confidence of the customer. Yeah, we take it for granted today that if we put something in the mail, it's going to get there and no one's going to have opened it. I don't think I've really ever had anything be tampered with that I know of that I've sent and it, you take it for granted. But uh, but the one time that there's a big issue with that, and which kind of takes us to the elections. I mean, um, can you talk a little bit about the 2020 election? It was a huge uh, undertaking that the USPS took on to handle the, the election there. Absolutely. And, you know, I'm just grateful, you know, we're sitting right at the back end of the 22 elections. And, you know, it's just uh, an amazing system of uh, elect, you know, uh, the the whole election process in the United States, this system of state and local election authorities that really uh, band together in order to be able to put on a seamless show every two years. And, um, you know, I, uh, I was fortunate in 2020 to be, uh, leading the, the, the charge at the postal service relative to obviously securing all the technology for, for our, uh, for the election. You know, the one thing that, uh, people don't necessarily think about is the postal service is the only, uh, provider for every election authority in the United States. So, uh, you know, it, 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 I think its roots really go back to making sure that the military could have mail-in ballots in order to be able to, to uh, mm. while they were overseas. Right. But, you know, mail-in uh, uh, ele- uh, balloting has now become the standard in several states. And, you know, I think uh, in 2020, it was so important because of COVID. Yes. Yes. We were concerned as a society about the spread of, um, uh, of COVID, uh, what was going to happen, uh, by bringing all of the, the citizens together to elect, you know, to, to election authorities and, and, and to polling places. Um, and so the post office played a, a key role in that 2020 election. And, you know, not without a little controversy. No, yeah. Uh, Obviously, I mean, um, you know, it it was early on uh, that uh, some of the political leaders were talking about the concerns of mail-in balloting and Mm -hmm. the integrity of of that whole process. And, Mm -hmm. you know, one of the first things that, that I did was really called upon my friend, Chris Krebs, and... You know, we uh, partnered to be able to uh, support that 2020 election, and I, my team was hand in hand with him uh, in those weeks and months um, uh, as we kind of got up to um, to the election. And you know, obviously, you know, you're checking every door, window, and uh, uh, crevice in order to be able to assure that, uh, you know, the technology, particularly the operational technology, the organization was secure in order to be able to properly sort, uh, the mail for, uh, for the election, uh, for citizens and for the election authorities after it was all said and done, uh, we moved, uh, on the inbound side into election authorities, 70 million ballots, which represented, uh, 45% of the general election. And, you know, I know there's a lot of controversy people talk about, but quite frankly, it's never been proven that anything was, was bad. And, you know, Chris Krebs was, you know, obviously, uh, um, uh, 
really chastised for running such a great election and lost his job as a re- result of it. But really, my hat's off to Chris and uh, making sure that we had all of that uh, operational threat intelligence that we needed in order to be able to uh, cover off on uh, any issues that that were was to develop. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, I know, yeah, there's a lot of scrutiny over all of that. I wonder, I know that, um, and we got to get to more of the risk topic, talk here in a second, but, uh, just, just, uh, it's a really interesting topic to me, um, because of all the recounts and things that had to happen. I just wonder how much scrutiny postal service came under to, to maybe, uh, prove that all the, you know, votes were delivered, none were tampered with. I mean, it, I wonder if there's an, a lot of extra work that had to be done after, um, oh, it, there, there was extra work going on uh, during and during. Yeah. And, yeah. And making that? sure that we had, you know, that that no ballot is left behind. Right. That mm-hmm. election authorities mm-hmm. have everything that was in the possession of the Postal Service as quickly as possible. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, th- right. There, there's a new priority. So, you know, typically it's first class mail and then bulk business, ma- you know, uh, from a hierarchy perspective. Oh. Well, yeah. when the election is on, there's only one thing to deliver, and that's uh, ballots. That right? makes complete sense. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> definitely. Um, so you can only imagine. I mean, we were on calls constantly to make sure that we had properly, uh, from an operational perspective, moved all of the ballots into the yeah. election authorities. And I'm sure that's what they did uh, earlier this week. So what are your thoughts on, do you think that voting will go online is this like does this experience of uh, of maybe now we're more comfortable with mail-in voting maybe we've, it's been tested nothing has been proven to be wrong with it or faulty or, or fraudulent with it um does that make it easier to move to an online voting system jameel i i had the great occasion to try to pilot uh from an innovation perspective some uh online methods for uh for voting and uh, f- very complementary uh, to making sure that there was a mail piece for each uh, electronic ballot so that we could have kind of a, a dual system of checks and balances. And okay, let, let me, me just say it's very political. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is not surprising. Yeah. <laughs> Understood. And, I'll leave, and I'll leave it at that, my friend. Yeah, yeah, I hear you that. Know, I, I, I could, I could spend probably you know hours talking to you about. We broke down the process in the election. You know, it, it, it's a life cycle, right? Lean Six mm-hmm. Sigma, understand value, where value is created in the process, break it down, make sure that it's input input into the technology controls. We worked for, had a whole team dedicated to that. Mm. Um, and mm-hmm. and uh and so we can speak speak at offline uh, yeah about yeah. that uh, love to yeah but it sounds like you're saying it's not a technical hurdle it's not a security hurdle it's more of a it's more of a there are some other things that are in the way of making that a reality yes yeah <laughs> okay got it so yeah so moving more into the risk um because as you know when we the last event that you uh spoke um you know in for us uh at the cyber guild here uh, we talked about how to talk risk so that executives and your board and your customers will really listen um so you know and a lot of this was about grc governance risk and compliance and the importance of that um and so i, I know you've got some background there and you have clients that you support through helping them strengthen their cybersecurity pros- posture in these ways um and, and compliance is obviously very important so my first question for you is uh you know, looking at, at my own organization um, and others like us that we work with, um, a lot of times, you know, what really drives us to get s- smart with our cybersecurity posture is really what what helps us sell our product or services better. And so a lot of times, as, as we all know, compliance is required pretty much to make the sale. And then that is really what leads everything. You know, okay, yeah, we got to get the SOC too. So, all right, we're missing a few things here. Let's start putting the, the minimum in place that we need to put in place to comply with so two, which might be minimal, minimal governance, um, risk. We're kind of not really thinking about. We're just looking to get through the sock too. So, yep. What, what is you know that sounds like uh, the way that I've seen a lot of organizations um, work with this. Is that is it your experience as well? Absolutely. I I think that there are a 
a minimum set of security controls that are table stakes for any organization. And getting a ISO 27001 or SOC 2 certification is just an assurance that you are meeting those minimum requirements. Uh, and then elevating the risk discussion is so much more uh, important for an organization and a different set of skills. It's not about compliance. It's about understanding the business value of the services that support your revenue, the assets that support those services, and really making sure that you know what the crown jewels are that are driving your organization. And, you know, when you look at an organization like the Postal Service, we understand, you know, that, the, you know, I talked about some of those key assets, you know, mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. you're talking about a, a retail organization with 31,000 facilities, bringing in money, you've got to look out for those, those uh, 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 retail assets uh, in order to be able to deliver those uh, ballots. You've got to have all of that operational technology because that's key services. That's a great articulation of understanding how your revenue is tied to your key services and the assets that are associated with them. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And, and then a lot of organizations uh, need to really stay true to measurement criteria mm -hmm. and recognize that, um, you know, I, 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 I love making uh, analogies between financial controls and technology risk controls. Uh, it's my belief that uh income statement, a balance sheet, a statement of cash flows are risk management tools from a financial perspective. Agreed. Agreed. And when we as information technology risk professionals can articulate uh, our uh, work in the context of uh, the financial situation of an organization, materiality uh, is, is a big issue. I think uh, some practitioners don't necessarily understand uh, the that you can't go run and chase down every single asset till you've got you know everything but down. You need to recognize that there are materiality um, uh, constructs that really can drive better decision making for your organization. Uh, and when you as a RICS practitioner can talk in material terms about the impacts of your cyber controls to your leadership and board, you are talking their language. And, uh, you know, when, when, you know, vulnerability management, for example, what's material from a vulnerability management perspective for your organization? Can't, how many CISOs can answer that question? And I see too many CISOs talking about their vulnerabilities to their board without a material materiality understanding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Meaning, you know, like, how does that? You know, if there's a breach, if there's if there's a some vulnerabilities exploited, um, how does that impact the revenue of the organization? How does that impact the ability for the company to exist? The customers are they exactly. going to stay? Is that what you're getting at? Completely. Yeah. So no good CFO is going to go in front of his board and talk about the few account payables uh, or that, that haven't been uh, cleared or the few account receivables that, that are, are coming in. Mm -hmm. uh, they would be laughed out of the boardroom. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. And we've got CISOs that are going into the boardroom mm -hmm. talking about issues that are not material yeah. to yeah to the organization. Right. And, you know, I think that's an area where there's a lot of opportunity for uh, growth from a information practitioner perspective. Yeah. And they're really the, the need to align with the business. That makes and, sense. You know, where, where's the money coming from? Where's the, the, uh, where are, where's the, the most material risk for the organization? Mm -hmm. You know, in, in, you know, I can tell old war stories now. Um, 
one of the one of the worst stories that there's a couple that I really like. One of them was about Wanna Cry and not Petcha. Mm. So uh, Shadow Brokers, you know, recount the story just briefly. Shadow Brokers was a hacking group that broke into NSA, a stolen exploit that ultimately became what was the 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 uh, vulnerability that was leveraged by uh, uh, Russia in order to be able to attack Ukraine for WannaCry and and not Petya. You know, the the threat actors poorly targeted attack. You know, kind of. I think it educated them on the uh, being a lot more targeted, but it impacted WannaCry impacted so many organizations. We as security practitioners had about a three week window between when the intelligence community and Microsoft uh, released the patch to be able to address the NSA vulnerability and when WannaCry hit. At the time, I was acting very quickly. I understood the consequences of an NSA level uh, remote code executable vulnerability that that could get privileged uh, uh, access. Uh, I knew I needed to to be able to to patch every system. When WannaCry hit, we were at about ninety five percent patching. Now. 95% patching was pretty good. But still, I had, you know, think think about how many computers. I was responsible for the security of 1.2 million computers. 95% of those computers, my, the Microsoft computers were patched in my environment. There's a number that were not patched. Mm-hmm. However, we had prioritized the patching. We were, we knew, uh, the dependencies that we had from a third party perspective. Mm-hmm. I was solid that day when WannaCry hit. I knew that those systems that had not been patched weren't very exposed to the internet. And I didn't think that we would have an issue. My business partner, one of the most important organizations from a partnership perspective, FedEx, was decimated as mm. a result of WannaCry. Oh, wow. And they're my biggest trading partner. They move all the express and priority mail of the United States Postal Service. Mm. And, you know, I think that's a demonstration of you need to understand the materiality of your vulnerability management program and recognize that 100% is maybe not always necessary, but you need to understand the business consequences if it isn't. And, Mm -hmm. you know, that to me, uh, you know, we, we, as soon as we found out that, you know, well, we found out pretty quick because from our operational perspective, FedEx was unable to move our uh, first class and our our express mail and our priority mail through their Memphis hub for, for over a week. And, um, you know, we were battening down every hatch and, you know, that, that was just an excellent example, I think, of understanding those business consequences in the context of the game that we play as information security practitioners to manage technology risk. Yeah, I think that illustrates it really clearly, you know, and as a, as a founder myself, um, you know, it's, uh, it's I, I know that, it, that that's a big, um, a big issue out there, I, you know, like you said, Looking at the financial statements is clear. Um, looking at your product or service and making that better is clear. Um, risk sounds like something that could happen one day. I, I, you know, if I, I, I'm not sure what the ROI is for me to put my energy there and looking into, you know, truly mitigating risk and looking at those critical assets and looking playing that game out to see what happens if there is something uh, that does occur. Um, I, I know that that's got to be something that is really. Uh, underserved in most most corporations and organizations out there especially on the small business scale um it seems to me that it's best to you know for any small business to to uh find a consultant who can come in and take a an eye from the outside to look in and and help you uh understand hey what are my risks and how do i you know how important are they what are my assets you know that's that's just something that 
uh, small business owners aren't aren't uh, aren't and it, most are not generally directly focused on. Um, so I really think that what you're saying makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I think right on, Jamil. I I've had the great occasion now after 18 months. Uh, you know, 18 months ago, I rebranded as a cybersecurity consultant, and I've had the opportunity to support large agencies uh, like DHS and uh, uh, the United Nations, and then smaller organizations and uh, uh, you know law firms and uh, defense contractors and such. And uh, to your point. Uh, this whole aspect of, of understanding uh, and managing uh, your th that that tie between you know what's really driving your organization from a revenue perspective and you know how 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 is your technology helping you to gain more customers how is your technology um, uh, able to operate within adversarial environments and your your business partners. Are adversarial environments. You know, FedEx was an adversarial environment to me, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And um, you know, I, I've got other stories that I can tell. Pit, the Pitney Bowes story is a great one, but mm -hmm. um, uh, when they got just decimated by a uh, 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 ransomware attack, and you know, literally, Pitney Bowes is the connection for the Postal Service to tens of thousands of small companies mm. and as a result of the security construct that we had around assuring that our postage meters operated properly within an adversarial environment uh, that data model and the integrity that we had in the operations allowed us to certify our financial statements in spite of our biggest postage partner pitney bows being completely owned from a ransomware perspective mm, mm. and their our customer our shared customer base was able to operate from a postage perspective uh which was just amazing and you know it goes to understanding how to operate your technology as well as your data model in that adversarial environment that you do business in it makes sense yeah you have a zero trust Kind of thing, definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, last question for you is really around 2023. Uh, you know, as we move into the new year, what are we? What's around the corner from a cybersecurity perspective? Um, you know, what what do you have to? What are your thoughts on that? I think the first thing is budgets. The cost of money is increasing for organizations. CFOs are are not going to have the access to investment capital. And it's going to be more expensive for them to borrow money. Uh, information security and technology risk practitioners are going to have to go forward with better business cases mm -hmm. in order to show the return that those investments will make for the organization. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you know, every interest rate increase is going to make it that much more difficult for risk practitioners to argue in tighten budgets. And I think some of these levers that we talked about uh, need to be reconfirmed often with leadership teams, mm -hmm. with the management of the leadership, uh, because they'll be making decisions relative to terminating lines of business potentially because of uh, return or the amount of investment that's necessary in that line of business. Uh, you know the the technology and and assets the the services and assets that support that line of business may no longer be as uh, as important to the company. So we really need to take a look at budgets and our uh, investment arguments from a return on security investment perspective, and then the threat environment uh, as a as a law enforcement prior 25 year law enforcement professional uh you know last year we saw russia uh basically make cyber an instrument of war and that has huge impacts that we need to understand from a critical infrastructure protection perspective in the united states mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you know no one would have put solar winds on the list of critical infrastructure for an organization true right mm -hmm. and so solar winds didn't see themselves as as a target mm -hmm. and 
you know, so many SaaS companies out there don't see themselves as a target. Right. So, right. you know, as, as we, um, as we understand and, and move forward with m- using more SaaS applications in our business, we mm-hmm. need to recognize that those, um, I hate to say that this, but their adversarial relationships that we need to understand as technology risk officers. So those are the couple of things that I'm really looking to be able to support organizations on in 2023 and, you know, what folks need to really be looking over their shoulder to, to think about. Excellent. Yeah, that, that's, that makes sense. Those are two things that are definitely happening next year. And I love your approach to, to how to deal with those. So, well, thanks, Greg. I really appreciate you taking the time. And uh, thanks again for joining us. Thank you, Jamil. I appreciate the opportunity and uh, grateful to be part of the Cyber Guild. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Cyber Matters, powered by the Cyber Guild. You can follow us on LinkedIn at the Cyber Guild or visit our website, www.cyberguild.org. If you liked this episode, please download and subscribe to our podcast and check back monthly for more episodes featuring top leaders in cybersecurity.